We are going to go now to um, to Joshua uh, chapters chapter one. We're going to look at um, one to eighteen, revising one to nine very quickly, and then. Uh, and then move on. Uh, chapter one. Now God says in chapter one, Moses is dead. And Joshua must reckon with it. And he's telling him to arise. Now the agenda that God gives to Moses in verse two is that he must go over this Jordan, he and the people. That's the assignment. He's arising to go over the Jordan. And he has the responsibility to lead the people. Now in verse two, I really want you to note something that is important. He says, I am, uh, he says, go over the Jordan into the land I am about to give you, to give them to the Israelites. The point I want to raise there is that, please note this. There is something God is ready to give you. I'm repeating. There is something that God is ready to give to you. When God prepares you, he is not preparing you for nothing. He is not wasting your time. It is because there is something he is ready to give you. I can assure you that God is going to give to each one of you something. He's going to give to each one some of you, to each one of you something. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all of these people get ready. Get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'm about to give to them, uh, to the Israelites. What we stressed yesterday was that the promised land, Canaan, signified rest from struggles, rest from hustling, rest from uh, struggling with sin, struggling with sin. It's amazing that there are people who are my age who are still struggling with sin. But who I want to teach, but some of you know this, that you can only get rest from struggling from sin when the sinful nature has been uprooted and when Christ is the only nature, the nature of Christ is the only nature you have. That teaching is a very, very important teaching, which you must not forget. You can't rest from sin until the producer of sin is removed. The producer of sin is what we call the flesh, or we call the old man, the flesh, the old man, or we call the reprobate nature, the reprobate nature, the fallen nature. When that nature is still in a person, even in someone who claims to be born again, who shall we say is born again? But if the flesh, the fallen nature is still there, 
His duty is to produce sins. That is why we hear of men of God who have started big churches, have fallen into sin. This guy in Australia, who, uh, what is his name now? He produces a lot of music. There's music coming from Australia that we like to sing. That man has left his church because he's fallen into sin. He is known all over the world. He's, he has not rested and he's not a young man. Even the anointing does not give you rest from sin until the sinful nature is uprooted. That's very important for us to understand that the sinful nature must be uprooted. If you don't understand that, you need to talk to us. Let's explain that to you. Then verse 3. I'll give you every place where you set your foot. That's a big promise. That's a big promise. Sometimes we take the promises of God lightly. I'll give you every place where you set your foot. Does that imply uh, occupation as well? He says every place. Every place. I'll give you every place where you set your foot. So if you're in academia, you set your foot there, God is going to give it to you. If you're in the corporate world, God is going to open doors for you to rise in the corporate world. Not only rise for yourself, by the way. When God gives you an opportunity to rise, he is giving you influence so that when you speak, you speak with authority. It's important for you to learn that whatever God gives you, God benefits from it. Let me repeat that. Learn that whatever God gives you, God benefits from it or the kingdom of God benefits from it. Let me give you an example. If God makes you a CEO of a company, don't think of the power that will have, uh, the money that will earn and end there. Ask yourself the question, why has God made me the CEO? What does God what does God want to benefit from my being a CEO? What will this benefit the kingdom of God? God gives you every place you set your foot so that the kingdom of God might benefit. It's important. It's important. I wish I knew this thoroughly when I was still a lecturer at the university. And when I became the head of department, I tried my best because I was a Christian, but I did not fully understand this. Some guy uh, in Switzerland, God has given her a PhD and she was working at a university, God, he says, I'll give you every place where you set your foot. But the question, why? Why are you giving this place? What do you want me to do for the kingdom? He says, as I promised Moses. Then he says, now your territory will extend. That's another point that you must note. God is about extending territory. When we are Christians, we are not stagnant. He says your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon and he gives the circumference of that. But I want just to camp on the word your territory will extend. I want to camp there. When God makes you a child of God, he extends your territory. 
he does. You don't become you don't become stagnant. You don't become stagnant. God, God progresses you. He progresses you. He extends your territory. That's why in education, if God gives you grace, there are all kinds of education. Maybe it is, it is uh, skill specific. Sometimes you can learn a skill, it's not about a degree, it's about a skill. You become competent in a certain skill, grow in it, expand it, uh, do more studies. We're living in days where we can study uh, through a long distance, study with a, a school. In, a credible accredited school in the US, in the UK, and do it um, through extended learning. Once you get that, it extends your territory. And those of you who are in business, God is looking for ways of extending your territory. Extend your territory. He's doing so because he wants to you to be a pioneer in opening in opening doors for the kingdom of God. In politics, I've seen people, God extending their territory in politics. In politics, <clears throat> I've seen that. Someone <clears throat> running to become a premier against all odds and God allowing them to become premier, premiers. In every area, God wants to extend your territory. Please note that. Write a note about that. God wants to extend your territory. Some of you right now are teachers, but God is looking to making you a principal. Because once you're a principal, you've got a certain amount of authority that enables you to have a greater influence. So these are promises. I will give you every place where you set your foot. That's a promise. I will extend your territory. That's a promise. Number five, no one will be able to stand against you. That's a big promise. That's a very, very big promise. Particularly in South Africa, where there's nepotism. You are highly learned. You have applied for a job. You are the most learned. But because of nepotism, you don't get the job. And they give it to someone else who is less educated. But once you're serious with God, You'll find them giving a job, giving you a job they did not mean to. They will give you a job they did not plan to. God forcing them to give you a job. No one will stand up against you all the days of your life. Ah, ah, this promises. I'll give you every place you set your foot. Your territory will extend. No one will stand against you all the days of your life. That one is frightening. It's a big, big, big promise. Even when you have been elevated to a position of power, you are a principal, you are a CEO, you are an CFO, whatever title God gives you, you'll be surprised that people will, will obey you because God has given the promise they will obey you. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. you want Noting these promises, number one, 
I'll give you every place you set your foot in. That's the first promise. Number two, I will extend your territory. Number three, no one will successfully stand against you. They may attempt to stand against you, but they will not succeed. And all the days of your life. Number four, I will be with you. That promise stands alone. I'll be with you just as I was with Moses. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Now, these are mind boggling promises. Never leave you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. This reminds me of Romans. 831, if God be with us, who can be against us? Romans 831. Now, in verses 3, 4, and 5, God gives us a series of promises. I want you to get that. This is a commissioning. God says, arise. God says, arise. And then in verses one to five, he, give a, he gives us this series of promises. Let me count them. I'll give you every place you go to. Your territory will, ex will extend. No one will be able to stand against you. It means succeed to stand against you. I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. Five promises God gives you. Whenever God appoints you, he gives you promises. That's why I must read the Bible and then take those promises. Five promises. He can never uh, give you a, res a responsibility and he does not give you promises. And the promises of God are precious. They're precious. It says, there's a song that says, the promise of God will never fall, even when the mountains fall. A song that talks about the promises of God. Now, verses three to five is God's, is God's responsibility. Whenever God promises something, the Bible says God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should promise what he will not do. That's in Numbers 23, uh, verse 19. So God is going to fulfill those promises. Now, what is your part now? There's God, that, that was God's part. Now, what is your own part? Your own part, you must be strong. Your own part now. It's important. You must be strong. Uh, leadership requires strength, particularly emotional strength. Because people are going to intimidate you. They are going to threaten you. So you must be strong. You, you must not be weak emotionally. You must not be a crybaby. You must be emotionally strong. You must be intellectually strong. Obviously, you must also be physically healthy. Be strong. Number two, be courageous. Then he gives the reason. Because you're going to lead these people to inherit the land. You can't lead people if you are not strong. You are not courageous. You can't. That's very important. If you're going to be leading people, you must be strong. They are going to be... Um, they are going to resist you sometimes. 
they are going to intimidate you and say things. You need to be strong. And I'm trusting that all of you will become leaders. That's God's way that we become leaders in the various areas where God puts us. But we need to be strong. We need to be courageous. That's your part. Then he repeats in verse 7, be strong and very courageous. Whenever God repeats something, it's because it is important, he repeats it. Which means this issue of being strong and courageous, this thing of not being weak and being easily intimidated. I'm seeing some of you, I'm, I'm noticing that, that some of you, I know you, that some of you were intimid, were timid. That's the word I want. Some of you were timid. You were frightened. You were afraid. But I see you outgrowing that. And I smile when I see you being strong and no longer timid. And I've seen you exercising that strength. A timid person cannot do, cannot do much. So be strong, be courageous. Then he adds number three now in those res responsibilities. He adds number three. It says, be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. That's number three. Obey what your leaders have told you. Obey the Bible. Obey the Bible. Don't turn to the right. Don't turn to the left. Just obey the Bible. That's number three. Now, obeying the Bible goes with a promise. It says, if you obey the Bible, you'll become successful wherever you go. Wow. Of all those things, that this one has a promise. If you obey my word, you'll become successful wherever you go. So number one, be strong. Number two, be courageous. Number three, obey the Bible. Number four, do not let this book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. So Number one, meditate on the word of God. Meditate on the word of God. Let's begin with meditate uh, before you, you speak. Meditate on the word of God, and then you can speak. Uh, let it not depart from your mouth. Uh, let it come after meditation. Meditate on the word day and night. And then speak. And then once you speak, something you have reflected on, something that is embedded in you, is authenticity. Okay. Then the third time, ah, verse seven, be strong, be courageous. And then, uh, where was the first one? It was verse six, be strong and courageous. Verse seven, be strong and courageous. Again in verse nine, be strong and courageous. Now you note how God, God does not usually repeat things like this. So, I mean, so repetitively. The issue of being strong is important. Sometimes God has given you education. God has given you skills. But because of our backgrounds, all of us have that background. Because of our backgrounds, we are fearful. We grew up, some, some of us, in small towns. So we are not as forward as people who come from big towns. We don't come from educated families. Uh, and therefore we tend to be sheepish. Uh, we lack confidence. 
we can't do much. We must outgrow certain things that we we were we were brought up with. The strong, the courageous. And I'm praying that you will be strong. Then he adds something else now, which is number six. Do not be terrified. There's something you know. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. So we see in this commissioning two things. One, about six promises God is giving us. And on the other hand, we see the posture, the posture we must adopt. Uh, we must be strong, we must be courageous, we must uh, be careful to obey the word of God, we must meditate on it, we must speak about it, we must not be terrified. Some, some environments are terrifying. One of them is the academic environment. We meet with people who have studied in Germany, studied in Oxford, studied at Harvard. That could unnerve you, that could and some people are eloquent and they seem so knowledgeable. You can become infuriated. Don't be terrified. You work in the corporate world and the pace there is fast. And, uh, don't be terrified. Do not be discouraged. Why? For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's another promise. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So all these nine verses are part of God's commissioning. And this commissioning comprises of God's promises and your own responsibilities. Very important. Now, number two now is the mobilization of the people now. Verses 10 to 15. Now, the man has arisen is mobilizing the people. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people. Ah, this man is already a leader now. If you read that in the King James Version, it says, then Joshua commanded. Ah. If you're in leadership, you must be in command. You must be in charge. Some people are put in place of leadership. They refuse to be in charge. So now we see Joshua commanding. He's in charge. Now. This is really arising. He's in charge. Who is he commanding? Officers. Officers. He's commanding them. What did he say? He says, pass through verse 11. Verse 11 is very important. He says to them, go through the camp and tell the people, get your supplies ready. He's talking about food. Now this is planning. Get your food ready. Because in three days from now, you will cross over the Jordan. Let's notice a few things there. Number one, he's in charge. Number two, he's planning ahead. He's planning ahead. They will be traveling in three days. So they must provide, they use the word in the King James virtuals. That's the word that is used. I prepare you virtuals. If you read it in the message, go, go through the camp and give this order. 
to the people, pack your bags. But it lives in something provision, provision. You read it in the good news, go through the camp and say to the people, get some food ready. I like that one. That is, that is, that is clear. Get some food ready. Why? It's because manna is still falling, but manna falls only in the morning. And that manna you cannot keep. You cannot keep manna and say, I will take more than enough. Manna was meant that you take enough for you to eat. And if you took more than enough, it will rot. Uh, they were, God was teaching them to depend on God for their daily provision. But now they, they, they have been fighting with people on the way. And there's what is known as spoils, spoils. When you defeat a, a, a group of people, you plunder their homes and you get spoils. It is out of the spoils that he says now, prepare which ones, prepare. Prepare some food for the journey. That's what he's saying. Prepare some food for the journey. Because in three days, we're going to cross the Jordan. We, we see confidence in him. He did not say, we, we will try and attempt to go over Jordan. He says, we will cross. There's faith in him. We'll cross the Jordan, the Jordan River, to occupy the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The land that the, that the Lord your God is giving you will possess. So now we see faith in this man of God. He has faith. There's, there's courage. There's boldness. There's a sense of responsibility. He speaks as a leader. He speaks as a leader. If I may prophesy over your lives, and I'm not, I'm not using the word prophesying lightly, lightly. <clears throat> Some of you are going to rise, are going to rise to high positions. Even to positions you never really planned for position that you never aspired for. <clears throat> God, God is, going to, is, going to, is going to do it. Some of you, if you are not, not, not leaders already, you will be leaders. You will, you will be leaders. And therefore, God is speaking to you in this way in preparation of where he is taking you to. Be courageous. Be strong. Don't fear. Don't don't be intimidated. <clears throat> he said. He said to him. Now to this. Now he's saying. Now you're going to cross over. We're going to get to the land. We are going to cross over. You must bear in mind that they've been trying to cross Jordan. And this Jordan was so inhibitive. So that whenever they tried to cross, this Jordan is standing as an obstacle. But this time he says, no, you are going to cross over. So as a leader, when you arise, faith is important. I can't overemphasize that to you, young people. Faith is important. You will do exploits through faith, strong faith. Read Hebrews 11, the old chapter. 
of Hebrews 11 talks about the exploits these people did through faith. Let me show you in Hebrews chapter 11, the exploits that they did through faith. Hebrews chapter 11. It was by faith we understand that the universe was created. It was by faith that Abel offered a better sacrifice. It was by faith that Enoch was taken from this life alive, verse 5. It was by faith that Noah, when warned about things to come, things not yet seen, in holy fear built the ark, it was by faith. It was by faith that Abraham, when called to go to a place, he would later, later receive as his inheritance obeyed. I don't know how many times it's by faith, by faith, by faith. So faith is important. And uh, Joshua is instilling faith now. They are moving. It's one thing for you to be freed from sin, from Egypt. It is another thing now for you to step into what God saved you to do, to enter into the promised land. Faith, faith, faith. I'm telling you, young people, you will accomplish a lot if you learn early to trust God, to trust God. I mean, I'm reading by faith from verse 1 to 24 in Hebrews, by faith, by faith. All of them begin by faith. In fact, it goes all the way up to by faith. I never noticed this up to verse 31. It's by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. Up to the one, it is by faith. Then in verse 6, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because those who have, who, who have faith must believe that he is, and that it was those who diligently seek him. That's important. Very, very important. And then he goes on to say that you will not only cross over the Jordan, but you cross over the Jordan to possess the land. You will possess the land. And it is the land that the Lord your God is giving you, is giving you for, for you to own. Let's, let's, let's personalize this. It's important to apply the Bible. There are things that God intends you to own. God is giving them to you. He wants you to own them. Now you must believe God, that God says, cross over this Jordan. Maybe there is a Jordan between you and something that God wants to give you on the other side of Jordan. Whatever your jo Jordan is, whatever your obstacle is, on the other side of your obstacle, there's something that God wants you to possess. Then in verse 13, it says, remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you. This is now God reminding Joshua the commands that Joshua, that Moses had given to Joshua. Let me speak very freely and openly with you. I'm praying that after we're gone, 
but God will remind you all the commands that we gave you. There are some commands that we gave you, one of which you should never get married to someone who's not born again. That's a command from the word of God. That's a command. Number two, you should never get married to a divorcee. That's a command. A divorcee whose spouse is still alive. That's what the Bible teaches. <clears throat> we can talk about uh, maybe some rare exceptions. I said rare exceptions. You should never get married to someone who is very much, much older than you. And the gap is big in terms of age. Big gap. Don't get married to a person like that. Um, and then there are many other commands. When you're employed, be faithful in doing your work. Be faithful. Because that faithfulness is going to make Christ to shine. So there are many other commands that we've given you. May the Lord remind, remind you, remember the commands that your, my servant Moses gave you. The Lord your God is giving you rest. Oh, there comes that rest now. There comes that rest. The Lord your God is giving you rest and has granted you this land. Oh, Canaan is a place of rest. A place of rest. Not a place of anxiety, a place of constant worry, a place of depression. You are set free from depression. You are set free from anxieties. You are set free. The Lord is setting you free. You are entering a place of rest. Then 14 is important and 15, it ends there. Uh, from 10 to 15 are the instructions that, uh, that uh, Joshua is giving to, to the people. It's mobilizing them. It's getting them ready now to cross over. He says, your wives, your children, your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you. No, I, I skipped verse 12. I'm sorry. You can't understand verse 14 if you don't understand verse 12. Now, here he's speaking specifically after you see in, in in verse 10, he wants them to prepare food, provision for the journey. This journey is going to take them three days. Now they must prepare food, provision for the journey. Then 11, he's telling them that uh, they will possess the land. Um, they will cross over Jordan, but 12 is very important 12. He's speaking to the tribe of Reuben. He's speaking to the tribe of Gad. He's speaking to the half tribe of Manasseh, three tribes. The Reubenites, the Gadites, the half tribe of Manasseh. So he's speaking directly now to these three tribes. He is reminding them of the command Moses gave to them, to these three, three tribes. 
what has happened is that as they were moving into the promised land, these three tribes were going to be given the land before they enter the promised land, just at the verge of entering the promised land. I'm going to show you some scriptures. They are going to be given a land there. And they made a deal with Moses, which we're going to read. There's a deal they made with Moses. So he says now your wives in verse 14, your children, your livestock, may stay in the land that Moses gave you east, east of Jordan. So east of Jordan, Moses gave them a land there. But all your fighting men, fully armed, must cross over. Which means these three tribes are not crossing over. They are getting the land before crossing over. But it says, but the fighting men, fully armed, must cross over ahead of your brothers ahead of the other tribes. They must be trailblazers. You are to help your brothers. Until the Lord gives them their rest. Ah, I really uh, pray that you'll understand these things. In verse 11, he says, now they are now entering their own rest. What is their own rest? The land that they're getting east of Jordan, that is their own rest. Because in Egypt, they could not own land, they were slaves. And a slave can never own land. They are going to be land owners for the first time. They will say, this is my piece of land. This is my own house. These are my own, this is my own livestock. They can rest. But now the three tribes are resting ahead of entering Jordan, east of Jordan, east of Jordan. I'm, I'm sorry, ahead of crossing over. But now he says now, but the men of these three, three tribes must cross over. Let me say this slowly. They are moving uh, from where they were, they'll be crossing over. But now God through Moses had given these three, three tribes land on the other side of Jordan. That's where they will be resting. Now he says, when you arrive in your own lands that are, are, are located to you, don't just settle there. Your wives can remain in those lands. Your children can remain in those lands. And your livestock, and I know you've got a lot of livestock, can remain in those lands. But you must go ahead of all these, these other tribes to help them to conquer their own lands. Because they will not rest until they also uh, possess their own lands. So I help them to possess their own lands. You are to help your brothers, verse 14 says, until the Lord gives them rest, as he has done for you, and until they too have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. After you, you may go back. So I'm sorry, after that, you may go back to occupy your own land, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of Jordan towards Sunrise. So this guy now is in charge, he's giving orders, he's, he's giving directions, he has time, time frames when things are to be done. 
Now let's go now to numbers. Uh, let's begin in Deuteronomy 3. Deuteronomy 3, verses 12 to 20. Let's begin there. We're finishing, we're just about to finish now. Deuteronomy 3, verses 12 to 20. The title there in, Gen, in Deuteronomy 3 to, is the division of the land. Moses divided the land before they, cro they crossed it. They scanned the land, he says, this one I gave it to this tribe. So he says, now of the land that we took over at that time, I gave the Reubenites, Verse 12, and the Gadites, the territory north of Aroa by the Enon Gorge, including the half, half the hill of half the hill country of Gilead, together with its towns. Then to the rest of Gilead and also all of Bashan, the kingdom of Og, I gave to the half tribe of Manasseh. The half tribe of Manasseh. The whole region of Agob in Bashan used to be known as the land of the Rephites. Then it goes on then all the way to divide the land. But it begins by allocating land to the Reubenites. Verse 18, I commanded you at that time, the Lord your God has given you this land to take possession of it, but all your able-bodied men armed for battle must cross over ahead of your brotherly, your brother Israelites. However, your wives, your children, and your livestock I know you have much livestock, may stay in the towns I have given you until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they too have taken over the land that the Lord your God is giving them across the Jordan. After that, each of you may go back, may go back uh, to possess the land I've given you. So now he's reminding them of what Moses said, and they had agreed that they would do it. Another scripture I want to show it to you quickly, 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 is Numbers 32. Numbers 32, quickly, from 16. Numbers 22 from this 16. Numbers 32 from verse 16. It's called the Transjordan tribes. Transjordan tribes. Then verse 16 says, then they came up to him who would like to build Hands here for our livestock and cities, for our women and children. It is the, those three tribes, the Reubenites, the Gadites, they have tribe of Manasseh. Then he says, but we are ready to arm ourselves to go ahead of the Israelites. They are making a promise until we have brought them to their place. Meanwhile, our women, children, will have fortified cities for protection from the inhabitants of the land of the land. We will not return to our homes until every Israelite has received his inheritance. Let's apply that quickly. Let's apply that. 
What that means is that God is going to apportion things to each one of us. And that we have to help each other as disciples. Help each other as disciples to fully attain our own portion. That's important. The, the, the importance of mutual help, of us helping each other to attain what God says is giving to us. So these three tribes have, been, have a land given to them, but they want, to, and they must possess it. It's one thing for you to be given something, it is another thing for you to actually possess it. Example, God may say, I'm going to make you a C CEO. That's a promise. And it is as good as gold. But it is your responsibility to possess what God has promised to you. Possess it. Some of you, maybe God may promise you to start an investment company. That's a promise. But it is up to you to literally possess the investment company. Some of you, God will tell you, you are going to become politicians, become ministers provincially and nationally. And it's a promise. But now it is up to you now to possess <clears throat> that promise. Now, some people's promises will come quicker than others. Other people's promises will be realized earlier than others. For an example, some of you are already in professions and others are not working yet and others are st still in school. Those of you who have already entered a profession, they're like the tribe of Manasseh, uh, the tribe of uh, um, Reuben, and the tribe of Gad. You are already in your inheritance. But now God says, even though you have already entered your inheritance, help others to enter theirs. And uh, I mean, help others. Others are still struggling. Uh, maybe they want to become accountants. They are not accountants yet. There are some struggles that they are facing. Can you help them to cross over? Can you help them to cross over to what they need to possess? That's important. If you are in business <clears throat> and your business was fl flourishing, you're like the Gadites and the Rubenites. You're already there. Leave your wife and your children, let, let them benefit. How can we help your brothers who also want to become business people to enter their inheritance and become business people? We can use it now, we, talk, we have talked about just practical things, but we can talk about spiritual things. You have grown to a certain extent and you are ahead of your brothers and sisters. Can we help them also now to enter what they've entered spiritually? Can we help them? Don't leave them stranded on the other side of the river without crossing over. Help them to cross over and to possess their possession. That's important. And then the last part of this verse, it's very simple, is the response of the people. Verses 16 to 18, the people responded. Then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us to do, we will do. And whenever you send us, we will go. Do you know that once you have confidence in leading people, 
he will follow. But if you are timid, you are unclear, you give ambiguous uh, instructions, they will not follow. There was no ambiguity in what uh, Joshua said. In three days we're crossing over. Prepare uh, virtuals or provision. You tribe of Manasseh, remember what you promised to Moses. I was there. You promised this and this and this and this. Now we're just about to end about you. Will, you your, your portion is on the other side of Jordan. Don't settle down there. Cross and help others to possess their possession. Very clear instructions. What do they say? Whatever you've commanded us to do, and wherever you send us, we'll go. Oh, may God bless you with this kind of spirit of obedience. Just as we fully obeyed Moses. Oh, this is very interesting. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as, you, as he was with Moses. Now let me pause there <clears throat> before we go to the last verse. Let me pause there. There is always a problem of followers obeying their first leader and not obeying the successor of that leader. It creates a problem. I've worked in, uh, in an organization as a leader of a work. And the leader was in another country. And it was amazing how the followers that I was leading in this country were obedient to the leader, the overall leader, but not showing obedience uh, to me as a leader. Uh, maybe God should impart in people obedience. When you obey the leader who is on top and you don't obey the leaders under him, you are actually not obeying the leader on top. Let me repeat that. If there's a principal and they are HOD, HODs, you obey the principal, you don't obey the HODs, you are actually not obeying the principal. Now, it's important that obedience <clears throat> starts from the bottom, it goes up, rather than starting from the top, because it is easy to obey those at the top while you disobey those at the bottom. We disciples don't work that way. We obey even people under us. So he says now, they say we will fully obey you just as you obeyed Moses. Please don't be frightened when I'm talking about death. You know now I talk freely about death. When we die and there are other leaders that emerge, we trust that they will emerge before we die. Give them the same respect and obedience that you are granting us. That's important. If your obedience to us is sincere, then your obedience to those who will succeed us, even those who are working with us in the work, 
who are leaders of centers, discipleship centers. Grant them the same obedience that you are granting us, the same. Then if you grant them the same obedience they are giving to us, it means the obedience you give to us is genuine. But if you obey us, but you don't obey those who are working with us, it means your obedience is not genuine. These are issues. And then the last verse says, whoever rebels against your word. These are the people responding to, these are the people responding uh, to Joshua. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey your words, whatever you may command them will be put to death. That's what they're saying. We will, we will ensure that people obey you. As a leader, you can't go too far if you have people who are not obedient. How do you move forward? And what delayed Moses? What caused Moses to take 40 days? And this young man is crossing in three days. And Moses wandered in the wilderness for 40 days disobedience. They even cost Moses the joy of seeing the promised land. Because if they had not been roaming around the desert through disobedience until all that disobedient generation died in the desert, Moses would have led them into the promised land. But this is a new generation. And by the way, this is a generation of young people. It's amazing, this is a generation of the under 40. They are ready to cross over. The over 40 have died in the wilderness because of their disobedience. All of them died in the wilderness. Now the under 40 say, we will obey, we will obey. And anyone who disobeys you and rebels will put him to death. Only be strong and courageous. They repeat now the thing. Be strong and courageous. So we're seeing three things now. God is saying to you, arise. God is commissioning you, is giving you promises. God is telling you what your part is. And God says, once you have arisen, mobilize. Mobilize people who will follow you as you lead them across across. Uh, the obstacles that will take them to their promised land. And we pray that as you obeyed your leaders and that those that you'll be leading will obey you, and then the work of God will run smoothly and that we shall all enter into the promised land. That's what God is saying to you as young people. Let me end there. Let me end there.